You want revival? Wait just a minute. Suppose we had one. Suppose we had one. We'd find out what we would be, be persecuted. We don't know now. The reason God's people not having a hard time in America now is we've got no power. There couldn't be any gospel preached over the radio. If we had revival, the Jews of this country would say, uh oh. Those folks mean business, and an Orthodox Jew hates the name of Jesus. He's been taught that Jesus is the illegitimate son of a fallen woman. And the only reason the Jews in America don't start a protest in any minority now and get the government to do anything, turn handsprings or anything, all they got to do is just say the word, and the gospel will go off the radio and television, newspapers and everything else. You ever thought about that? The reason they let us preach the preach on the radio now is they know the Jews know we ain't getting nowhere. Our little brand of Christianity wouldn't hurt, hurt a flea. You ever thought about that? You know, I'm going to tell you something that sort of scares me. Did you know that the Jews in Israel and the anti-God communists in Russia have cornered the gold market? Did you know that Israel and Russia can bankrupt the world before I can get through preaching if they take a notion? That's the God's truth. Did you know our government is bankrupt with $3,500,000,000 in debt on Social Security alone? They ain't got a dime in the Social Security fund. They done spent that something there. Suppose those anti-God people over in Russia and those anti-Christ people, the Jews are anti-Christ and the Russians are anti-God. Suppose we had a revival in America. It meant something to be a Christian. Churches weren't ignored. The gospel's being honored and prosperous. <laughs> Men's lives would be changed. Woo! Those Jews, anti-Christian, those communists, anti-God. They could bankrupt America just like that. Do you know that? That's right. I don't know whether we want revival or not. Your home, you'd lose it. Your insurance policy, you'd lose it. And your everything on the God's earth you've got, you'd lose. And that's join the bread line, I expect. Because if God ever visits America... The anti-Christian Jews who let us alone because we ain't bothering them and the anti-God communists that are taking this world fast today. They'd wake up and turn off the water and take the meter out so we could say scat. You want a revival? What we preach now is so little offensive because there's so little power in it. Nobody much objects, so just ignore us. But if God should anoint his preachers and his people and his church and vindicate his gospel, brother, the world couldn't ignore any longer. And we learn what it is to be hated by a world that crucified the Son of God. Revival has split every church in Dayton. It split this church, split yours, Brother Brown. Yes, it would. Do we want God to come and intervene? If we do, I want to call your attention to three things that God's people desperately need to examine that prayer life by. First, we pray sinfully. When we pray selfishly, we pray sinfully when we pray selfishly. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, but you may do what? Consume the, the answer in your own lust. That word lust is not a bad word there. It's a strong desire, but something I want. 
One of the classic examples of a man who prayed selfishly was Balaam. If you leisure, go back and study the book of Numbers, chapters or 22 through 24, and you'll recall that Balaam was a prophet. And they brought and offered him money if he pronounced a curse on God's people. You'll study there that Balaam did three things that are fine. Balaam was an habitual prayer. That sounds good, don't it? It was his habit. It was his custom to pray. You read those chapters from the king, Balaam, some of his supporters will come and make Balaam a proposition. Balaam will say, well, you just hang a little while and I'll, I'll get in touch with the Lord. See what he just said about it. It is his habit to pray. That's good, isn't it? That's good. In the second place, you find by reading those chapters that Balaam prayed in secret. He'd say, now you just stay here and I'll go and get in touch with God. The scriptures talk about when you pray, enter in your closet and shut the door. You know. That's good. Isn't it? That's nothing wrong with praying in secret. Mr. Moody wouldn't pray with anybody. He said he didn't have time to listen to folks pray all around the world, never ask God for anything definite, and he just prayed by himself. Well, that's not so bad. Praying in secret's good, isn't it? Making habit, <clears throat> making it a habit to pray, that's good, isn't it? That's the third thing good about old Balaam. You read that and you'll find he sometimes prayed all night long. Prayed all night long. You say, I inquired with the Lord all night. That wouldn't be bad, would it? <clears throat> I bet you there's not one of us to pray five minutes without your mind wandering. Did you ever try it? You clock yourself sometime. I bet you're down a half count of cash. You can't pray five minutes. That's hard to do. But old Balaam kept before the Lord the same proposition all night long. My Lord sometimes prayed all night. One time, you know, his best disciples went to sleep on him. They couldn't cut the mustard, brother. Balaam made it a habit to pray. That's good. Balaam prayed in secret. That's good. Balaam prayed all night sometimes. That's good. But he didn't get anywhere. Why? He prayed selfish. He'd get God to do what he's asked him to do. He'd get a lot of money. He prayed selfishly. Brother, I'm telling you what. The fact, if you do like I tried to do, look at the chain myself. I quit it. Some of the old time folks used to talk about having a prayer sheet. Pray your request. And the days when you made them. Then on the other sheet, leave it open to put down the date when you get the answer. Yeah, right now, your batting average will show go down like mine does. And then if you make a sheet of the request to keep going in all sincerity, I doubt not to God Almighty. You can save room to take out all of the selfishness that's in your request. There won't be much left. Let's listen to us pray. Oh, Lord, bless our church. Well, how can you? Unconfessed sin. Most of the members are lazy. They ain't worth killing. Most of them just going through the motions. Never open their mouth to warn sinners. Don't know what it is to weep over lost men. Don't know anything about that. You want God to bless that outfit? No, no. No. Oh, God bless America. Well, how could?
could God be God and bless America that tearing up God's law done done away with God's Sabbath done away with all morality done away with all respect for anything that's decent gone in the whirlwind with its madness and thumbing its nose against the holy God we ask God to bless that no God bless our preacher. He don't need blessing. He needs the heavy hand of God's judgment on him to whip the stuffing out of him so he can pray. Amen. Bless, 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 bless. Well, God ain't doing it, brother. It must be he's found out that we want something for ourselves. Not that the gospel would prosper, that the church would be honored, and that the glory of God's Son might be made manifest. Now, I don't know nothing about what I'm going to say now. My granddaddy knew a little something about what the Bible talked about when it talked about that God should get glory in the church world without end. Amen. That who should get glory? God should get glory. We don't know nothing about that. I don't. All I've ever heard, Lord, bless our church, bless Brother Barn, bless Brother Kirkman, bless the Sunday School, bless the Deacon, bless America, bless, bless, bless. I guess God found out we're more interested in feeding my own religious flesh than there are the glory of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Examine our praying. Take out that which we ask amiss that we may consume it on the strong desires we have ourselves. Won't be much left of our praying, brother. Sinful praying. In the second place, prayer, according to the Bible, is sinful when it's a matter of duty. Boy, I got you now. You turn to the 13th chapter, 1 Samuel. Read about old Saul at the list scene, gathered several thousand soldiers. He can come down and lick the living daylights out of Saul and his little company of men. And so Saul, uh, he's expecting old Samuel to come get him out, as he always did. And Samuel didn't show up. And when Samuel, the God's prophet, came, didn't come, old Saul, uh, uh, he, he, he said, I forced myself to offer a burnt off. I've been going up and down the country now a long time. Wherever I go, they invite me to come have what we call a revival meeting. We don't even know how to spell the word. And so the pastor gets up, dear brother, and he says, Now, folks, we're going to have a revival. We've got to pray. And so some few of the saints come out, and they didn't much want to, but they're better. And so as a matter of duty, they force themselves to go through the motion. Samuel, Saul said, a force myself. Didn't want to. Just a matter of being religious, and so I forced myself. See? I forced myself to offer a burnt offering. Well, I'll pray, folks. Don't want to, but we ought to. Come on now. Let's pray. And we force ourselves to do what is the very breath of being a Christian. And God help us in this kind of praying. 
We don't expect anything to happen, and we're not much disappointed when it don't. We didn't expect God to pay much attention to us anyhow, and we don't miss a night's sleep as we prayed, and God don't listen. We're just going through the motion. Years ago, I went down to Old Mexico and spoke a month to one of those outlaw stations being to the United States. And I spoke at 6 o'clock every morning. I stayed on the American side and across the Rio Grande every morning early and get over there for live broadcast at 6 and then again at 9 at night. They had a communist as governor of Mexico at that time, and every church in Mexico, even Catholic, was closed. And I drive in my little car through the city on the Mexican side on the way to the radio station about 5.30 of the morning, dark in the wintertime. There'd be thousands of those poor Mexican Catholics standing on the outside of that closed churches counting their beads, saying their prayers, forcing themselves to be religious, you know. And they tell me the Hindus over in India got a speech, you know, they got the little prayer wheels and they just set them to sinning. They can pray more prayer in the minute we can all day long, just going through the motion. Oh, God. I read of a time that's coming on this earth. I love to have a little taste of it. When God Almighty says, I will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication. And we wouldn't go like driven slaves to the place of prayer to force ourselves to go through the motion, thus insult. God, like little children who are hungry asking Mama for bread, with the spontaneity of that, without going through the motions and without not expecting anything to take place, we go to our Heavenly Father, not as a matter of religious duty and form. But like little children going to the source of all blessing. And bless God, encouraging ourselves in the Lord, and building up one another's faith until we had an expectancy. And that if a boy goes to his earthly father and asks for bread, his daddy won't give him a stone. And if God People would go to the Heavenly Father and ask for bread. He wouldn't give them a stone either. It's sinful to pray as a matter of duty to go through the motions and God help us. We do that so much. But in the last place, it's sinful to pray as a substitute for obedience. It's sinful to use prayer as a substitute for obedience. And boy, here's where we're guilty as dogs. It's a whole lot easy to go off in the little room, shut the door, and go through the motions of prayer and it is to stand up on your hind legs. In a human civilization like ours. And press the demands and claims of God for the Son of His love on the people you have a chance to talk to. For so long, most of us have substituted some form of prayer for 
personal obedience to the truth that we have been made witnesses of the dying, crucified, and thrown Lord of glory. It is not optional. We'll decide whether we'll be witnesses, brother, we are his witnesses. So we remember in our day will bring it to pass that our lips shall be loosened. They've been tongue-tied so long. And our witness and testimony has been so halting and so powerless. The church will come together and pray for God to save the lost and ignore the fact that he doesn't save the lost people apart from using the witness of his people. He don't. It's a whole lot easier to pray, oh Lord, save the lost, than it is to witness to them when some of them will spit in your face. As up in Kenosha, Wisconsin, in a so-called city-wide meeting that took me down to the big factory and I preached over the radio and to the noon, to the factory workers as they, as they had the noon meal and broadcast. And a young fellow came up to me after service one day and said, Preacher, what do you do when you try and talk to somebody about the Lord and they spit in your face? I resigned right there. I said, I don't know. I expect I took my tail and run. But God witness, spit or no spit, that's our job. I'm talking to you, man. This little timid stuff we call witnessing ain't getting to first base today. Not getting to first base. Ah, oh, you're my witness. Well, I will meet and pray and not witness. And we come and say, Oh, God, save old Bill! But nobody's preached to him, nobody's colored him, nobody's prayed for him, nobody's wept over him, nobody's confronted him with the claims of God for his son. So we come and say, Lord, I ain't going to talk to nobody they don't want to be talked to, and that's the God's truth, but you save them anyhow. That's sinful prayer, isn't it? That's sinful prayer. You want revival? we got to cut out this prayer for ourselves. Something good to happen to us. Him get the glory. We got to learn how to pray, not as a matter of religious form, but the heart cry of a child of the Father. We got to quit substituting forms of prayer for personal obedience. I'm telling you, revival came. I remember the time revival broke out in Detroit, Michigan, and God's men had to take a Bible with them to work in the factories. The communists would spit at them and cuss them and everything else. In those days, the communists take a man wouldn't join the union that was in still traded with communism way back yonder, and two men or the whole of the fellow wouldn't join the union or claim to be a Christian. Another fellow would take a iron piece of iron and break his arm. They did that by the thousands in that city. I know, honey. If God put his power on this generation of church people that are saved, all hell would break loose, brother. Somebody says we had revival to solve our problem. Wouldn't do no such thing. You'd create a million we know nothing about now. It would, folks. It would, folks. But as God's the judge of this poor, ignorant preacher talking to you tonight, we are shut up to getting the attention.
teaching of a living God. This thing gone so far, it's too big for us folks. And I'm here to challenge this church. Get your time to pray. Sometime tomorrow, get down on your knees. Let's get let's get this let's get to praying, folks. Take your book, dissect your prayer life. You're not too pious to do that, are you? Start dragging out that that you just want to consume on yourself and this matter of going through the motions and no heart's desire in it and substituting a form of prayer or confronting this generation with Jesus Christ. I think when we start putting obedience in its place, <clears throat> prayer in its place, they go mighty well together. I think a congregation that's going out a hundred percent to get the blood of sinners off its hands can come together and say, Lord, we've done what our hands found to do, what our hammering lips could say we said, what our broken heart could weep we wept. And now, Lord, we can weep and we can pray and we can witness but only you can see. I think you got right to pray that way when you lift up clean hands and we've done what we could do. Revive it! Yes. God knows we pant for it. Maybe you don't, but a public preacher like this man, I'm telling you that God's truth. I'm desperate to see once again. I'm so tired and talk about what happened back yonder. I'm so desperate. Oh, I'm desperate that things would happen in this community that only God can bring to pass. And then would we'll say, that's the finger of God, that God did that. They say, oh, well, that's just what those folks down there believe, and every man's got to write his own opinion. I believe I'm as good as anybody else. One church is good as another, and don't make any difference what you believe, just so you're sincere. And we're all headed for the same place. I'm sick and tired of all that. I long to hear men and women say, that's God. That's a living God. And I'll leave you tonight. With the challenge of my heart under God, I believe it is the obligation of every generation of those who name the name of Jesus Christ to see God demonstrate his power and buck a generation's past the hill, facing men and women in a living way with the sovereign Redeemer, of the Lord Jesus. Examine your prayer life. Don't get mad at me. Cut it all to pieces. Amen. Let's go to prayer. Let us stand.